Alright, so thanks for being here. I'm, I'm Ananda Gunath and I'm from Carnegie Mellon and uh, I'm actually teaching right now in Princeton because my wife is there. So I got uh, a teaching, uh, I'm teaching an algorithms course at Princeton and uh, I'm going to show you some of the uh, work with the engagement that I've been able to do with uh, Classroom Salon at Princeton. Okay, um, so I guess you guys all have a computer, so I want to get you, you know, sign up, get started, and, you know, uh, this way we can, uh, you can do whatever I'm going to do, because all my slides and everything is on Salon. Uh, so you can, uh, so if you, what you need to do is to go to classroomsalon.net. So if you go to classroomsalon.net, uh, that should take you to the, the platform. Um, <clears throat> and this is our latest the platform. There's an older one, classroomsalon.com. There's about 30,000, 40,000 people on that one, but that's, this is our new thing, and um, we are hopefully, this will be much better, I'm hoping, and, and hopefully you can give us some uh, feedback. Okay, so are you all there? Oh, you have to use Chrome, I'm sorry. So for the new one, you have to use Chrome. Uh, old one, you can use anything, but the, except for the Internet Explorer. But the new one for now, it's Chrome, but it will be working with Firefox and Internet Explorer uh, when it's all done by the end of the summer. Oh, end of summer. Okay. Yeah, end of summer. So we will have something really great by the end of the summer. Will, will old courses be able to be imported to? Yeah, we will <laughs> push right some of your, yeah, so it's a new database, so we'll push some of those old ones. In. So you will get the same stuff. Like if you have uploaded content before, then it'll be. We're having trouble, yeah. Oh, it's not loading? Uh, no. Uh, it's like your word tonight, man. I know. <laughs> We're not near this forwarding. Yeah, yeah, so it's classroomsalon.com colon 8082. It's yeah. a nice website. Uh, okay. okay, it's okay. That's, yeah, that's, it's forwarding to that. So that many is sort of like a mask. Do we need the 8082? Yeah, yeah, you need 8082. Otherwise, you're going to the old one. I'd like you to uh, look at the new one. Mom is saying it can't be reached until I'm just Really? Colon 8082. 8082. 8082. How about a registration code? What's that? How about a registration code? Oh, registration code is Princeton. Okay, so if you're there, you can click on the sign up and the, you can use the registration for Princeton for now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I better check my so, uh, no, uh, Chrome only for now, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so if we have trouble, too much trouble getting everyone on board, I can just demo it then. So you guys can be okay, when you go back, maybe it'll be fine, right? Okay, so, um, so anyway, so you can bookmark this website, that's classroomsalon.com, colon, eighty eighty two. Uh, if you're using a mobile device, you should be uh, you should be doing mobile. That means it will have a better. Uh, you should be using something like this, where you get a, a simpler screen. And then when you log in, uh, the mobile thing only works with the videos right now, uh, but hopefully yeah. we'll have some. Only works with Windows. Yeah, this one. Yeah. So this you can if you if you have a mobile device. You can put uh, a shortcut. It's like a website, so there's nothing to install. Uh, but you can uh, you can have your videos uh, playing, and uh, you can look at the comments. Uh, you can so navigate uh, uh, You can navigate through uh, and so on. But for that, you have to use the uh, code. So if you're using a tablet or a horn, you know, just use the mobile version of it uh, because that's designed for that. Okay, um, so let me get going because of the time limitations. I want uh, also Marcus to say a few things about the salon. Uh, so basically, if you uh, register for the uh, register for the platform, and uh, if how many of you were able to do it so far? Okay, great. 
So if you go to recommended salons, oops, let's see, my salon actually. Yeah, if you go to recommended salon, you should see this Rima blended lending salon. Okay? Now, you can create your own salon. If you want to create a salon, you just have to create a salon. So I'm going to just show you the salon I created for this session so I can demonstrate the kind of features that we have. Um, so I'm going to go to the blended learning salon here. <clears throat> All right, so first thing I'd like you to do is, I was hoping to bring some paper in case technology doesn't work. Um, I'd like you to sort of uh, do this. Um, sort of, then there's, if you go down the link, if you don't have this, that's okay, you can do it later. But there's a little free conference uh, survey link, which is a Google Doc. And I like to collect some information about who you are so I can be in touch. Because one of the things I like to do is to, because I don't have all the answers when you're building this technology, so you are the teachers. So I mean, I, I'm also a teacher, but I think you have a lot of things. Did you give us a registration code? I forget what uh, Princeton. Okay. Yeah, use Princeton. Lowercase? Uh, yeah, lowercase. All right, so if you uh, if you log in, you're going to see all of this stuff. Um, and all of these things are relevant to what I'm going to do today. Uh, and like I said, the you can form, fill out that Google form anytime. That's, I just need to stay in touch. All right, so let me just uh, say a few things, and then we can have a discussion, hopefully, right? Um, so Salon is, and some of you have used Salon, but Classroom Salon is like a project we started at Carnegie Mellon a few years back. We were trying to create a platform that will take content and then make the content more interactive and engaging. And uh, so we decided to build kind of like an architecture which is content-centric, as opposed to a regular course management system which is very course-centric. So it's more like a tree, starting the course, modules, and all that. So in our case, we think of our content architecture like a graph. So it's like each content item can be linked to another one, to another one, and to another one. So that's sort of the underlying sort of thinking. And I worked with the head of English at CMU on this project, uh, we were trying to understand how people think about content, the interpretation. And uh, uh, because in sciences, in my field, I teach computer science, you know, we have the absolute truth, right? You know what's right. <laughs> and I'm the God, and students have to believe what I say is always right. In humanities, that's not the case. How many of you are humanities? Okay, so let's reject your description of the <laughs> <laughs> So the, in my field, the, I think the knowledge is converging to some common understanding. In humanities, your knowledge is very divergent. Right? So many interpretations. And so we were trying to build a platform to serve both sides. But I think uh, to some extent, we did that. OK. Um, <clears throat> All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just start with the uh, presentation, which is also in Salon. Um, so this is called the blended learning presentation. Um, now, presentation is a, so again, my idea is that, you know, you can go to, you have, will have access to this, all this stuff. This is just the presentation. Um, so once you log in, you can complete the bio, answer three questions, and fill out the pre-conference survey form. So the Salon abstraction is essentially a, a, a group, a person individually interpret the document without maybe knowing what the others are thinking about it. So we have in Salon a mode for individual mode, so you can lock the, uh, the document so that the user only sees his or her annotations. And then after some time, it can open up for everyone to see what collectively what everyone has done. Okay, so our workshop goal is to develop a good model of content engagement. So I'm sure you have much better ideas than me, but I'm just going to share with you my experiences with getting engagement from content, which is very important to what I did at Princeton. Um, and hopefully we'll work together as a group 
to uh, improve this model for blended learning. And uh, you can help us sort of be part of a team of educators to really shape the future of this platform because we control the technology side of this thing and we want to kind of develop it to a, something that teachers can help. You know, it was developed by teachers for teachers, so it's, it's hopefully we understand what we're doing. Okay, so what I want to do is to start with demonstration in my own class, but um, so let me just show you my experiences, and then I'm going to ask Marcus to Marcus Prose from uh, Illinois, who is here, is used Salon for many years. In fact, I always seek Marcus's wisdom when uh, when we try to put a new feature. I always call him and say, Marcus, you think it's going to work? You know, and he's going to say no, and oh yes. So I don't know. He says many other things he wants from me. I have, we haven't done it, and uh, he has a big wish list. So I'm going to show you my Princeton class, so you can get an idea of what a course would look like once you use this. So I'll take you to my Princeton course. So this is what the Princeton salon looks like. And um, luckily the Princeton allowed me to uh, teach a flipped algorithms class. And the registrar didn't like it first because I said I'm only going to go to class once a week. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the students don't want me to see, don't want to, because I have a big class. And uh, in fact, uh, to show you how big it is, uh, this is, these are all my students. These are all my students. There's, there's 230 students in my class. Right, so I didn't want to, you know, obviously I, I took a subset of this, but I didn't want to give a lecture, which I didn't believe it's the effective way of doing this. So what I wanted to do is to engage with the content before the class, and then I would use that data as part of driving the class. Okay? Um, so I will show you how I do that. So in Salon, you can upload your content. So you can upload a text document, a PDF document, or a video document. Uh, videos are either YouTube or Vimeo. So, so you have a YouTube, any YouTube video, you can just, all you have to do is just plug in the URL if you have a YouTube, if you just plug in the URL, it will find the video. You can uh, give your own title for it and then put them into the saw. Uh, if it's a PDF or text, you can upload it. And that's how I, I start doing things. Now, so before I do the class, what I do is, um, so these are all my things that I have uploaded. So I'll show it to you. Um, so this is my course, and I like, I, in my course, I'll show you the structure of the course. So I have <coughs> divided the course into weeks, so there's the, the, the structure of the course, which is kind of weird, but we hopefully will get this thing right later. But that's the uh, structure of the course. So if I go to, say, lecture 15, um, all my content is now this can be PDF or this can be video. So I'm only using video, so I'm going to demonstrate with videos, but you can do anything you want. Um, what this shows you that the uh, 39 people have commented, made 41 comments in that specific video, and I can print those comments, I can manage the settings for that video. So for example, let's say that, uh, you know, that's one of the things about Salah. So once you upload a media, you can click on the, it's manage. So each media has a manager, which case, you know, which Salah it belongs to. Um, and you can create a duplicate copy of that media. You can set your tags, like for example, I like to set tags like, uh, I want to know more. So that would be a tag. Uh, let's see here. Oops, so those are like you can have a set of predefined tags that the students will use as they annotate the video, and I can have a, a discussion schedule, meaning that you can have an individual work time, and then uh, you can have a group discussion time. So usually, typically, 
I want the students to individually look at this video without seeing other people's comments. And then after a couple of days, uh, they can look at the whole thing. Um, and also I can do this uh, because students always want to know what's new this week, right? So I can do things like, okay, so this video is going to be effective from, what time was it, 97, 37, okay. So it's going to be around for, for a day, and end time would be say, something like this here. I can give you instructions for that video, and then update that. Oh, add the description. Please watch this. <coughs> OK, and then done. OK, so as soon as I do that, when the students come to the platform, uh, they're going to see here, see the to-do list. So that video appears. So when the students come, they can say, what's due today? So they're, it's happy. It, it shows up here. Um, all right, so how does my content look like? So this is how my content looks like. So, so the, typically what I do is I go to a specific place, and I can embed a question. So I could put, uh, like, uh, here's a question. OK, so I can ask the question, what do you think of this? So I can, I can point them to a specific location in the video or in the, in the document. Uh, uh, this them. is uh, the idea of an MST as a model. OK, so once I do that, it appears here. But, but this is just a comment so far. And as an instructor, I have the right to do this, this little star that says, make it a local prompt, meaning that this will now go to the top of the list. So no matter how many people come in, so when the students see the local prompt, they know it's something they are supposed to be doing. In fact, the students like this idea. I did a lot of surveys about I, I, I struggle a lot about how do I get the students to do the work, <laughs> right? And I said, go make three comments. They don't do that. You know, in sciences especially, they don't want to make something wrong, and you know, they are very careful. Uh, but then once I put the prompts, you can see that how much um, activities I'm going to get. So when they see when they see this problem, so they can they can actually jump to this it. is uh, the idea of an MST as a model, and then they can say reply to it, and they can provide a reply. Now, if it's in the individual mode, they don't see the other people's replies. Um, all right. Now, the uh, the nice thing about this thing is that when everybody has replied, this is like a my students like multiple choice. They don't want to write anything. They just want to say, OK, I'm going to pick the right one. Um, in fact, there's a mode called interactive mode. They can play the video in interactive mode. So when the uh, video comes to this timestamp, it'll automatically pop up this window and ask them to respond to it. And once they, after they respond to it, they can actually see the response that I have given. So they get to see that. So this way, they can check to see if it's correct. Uh, they can also look at, once I open it up, uh, notice that most people use anonymous names because I encourage them to use anonymous names. Uh, I'll show you, although they're anonymous, they're not anonymous to me, but they're anonymous to the uh, classmates. Uh, they can actually read. They can see what the other people said. They can look at any one of these things. Obviously, they don't look at all of them, but typically look at my answer page if that's the right thing. All right, so what else can I, can I do? Um, so before I go to class, I kind of like to, you know, I may have a lot of comments. I may have not have a lot of comments, but in the humanities, you're going to get a lot of comments. Maybe uh, Marcus can talk about this. Uh, but I can click on this analytics uh, icon. And what that will do is to show me uh, the, how the students actually use that media. So this shows me that the 20th of March, 
is the most active time for that uh, document. And it also shows who was participating. And soon we're going to have something called who's not participating. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, but in my case, I can't do it because it's, I have so much to worry about here. Uh, so there, these are the people who are making, you know, like you can see, that's me in the middle, and you can see how the people are using the platform. Uh, you can also see, um, for any document, it creates this uh, summary of things. At timestamp four, there was a, a question, and these are all the answers to that question. So you'll be able to get everything out of the document and take a look at it. You can also look at it this way. Uh, in my classes, they don't really grow deep. Uh, they just, I just ask a question, they give a response. There's no follow-up discussion. But in humanities, there may be a lot of discussion. If that's the case, this would be very interesting. Because this shows uh, the node in this discussion tree that's uh, so it does it for every every document. So you can essentially go, go through that. Now, as a class, so well, here are some of the things. So I could use this. So what I'm trying to, to say is that I'm using, I'm putting prompts to get them engaged, and then I'm using this data to really go teach. Because with the data that's coming from the platform, it's easier for me to know what I should be teaching. Because I never know what 220 students want. Right? So if I can get the best summary of what they want, I can at least try to do a decent job there. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting is that the, with the platform, um, <coughs> I'll let you ask questions and after and after stuff. I can also look at the overall uh, activity uh, trend of the salon. So this is showing me this whole semester's graph. You can see there's a huge spike here, but I don't know what happened here. It's like probably closer to the middle of So for some reason, all students is, you know, decided to be very active. I'm not sure why that. <laughs> Usually that, that's not the case. And there were 3,800 uh, uh, comments. And uh, the uh, <coughs> thing is I can actually get uh, this down that goes in my student IDs here. But uh, this shows every all the details about what the students did. I can get them as a CSV file. Uh, I can sort it by comments. I can sort it by the consistency. So I can know, you know which student is the most consistent student. In other words, that because it's important for me to know that if a, if a student is active five days, was that student active five days in a row, or five days every ten, I mean, a day every, you know, like 50, for 50 days, right? So I think in our formula, we are saying that person who is active 50 days, you know, every 10 days they're doing something maybe more consistent. They may, uh, but I don't know what that means, but they, they are more consistent than person who is active just five days in a row. Uh, so it gives you an idea about who is really doing what, so you can uh, keep, keep track of that, you can get this out. And another thing you can do is that you can take a person and uh, see when that person was active. So this red line shows that this person uh, stopped being active on the 25th. Uh, and if I go to another person, let's go to someone else here. Yeah, so we can see the few comments that person made. Uh, let's see if I can find someone who was not active. So if there's a person, that's, a, that's lack of engagement, obviously, right? So I have a data to show that this person was only active between uh, about a few months. So I need to know what happened there. And also the another thing that I get from this data is that I can see when a specific uh, concept was uh, looked at by the students. So if you look at this uh, concept called bottom of merge sort here, it was <coughs> studied by the students in that period, and they haven't done anything since. 
Uh, but in some cases, you may be able to find something that's been accessed a lot. So that will tell me that maybe they are, you know, that's hard or they want to know more about this. They keep going back to it. That's related to something else. But there are a lot of things I can, I can uh, deduce from that. Um, so one other thing I will show you is the, uh, uh, the uh, as an instructor, I'm also able to see uh, exactly how much time is spent with every component. So you can see there's, uh, so this uh, perhaps in, is an indication that the uh, strong components lecture was maybe hard, because 389 hours uh, total spent time. This means that they started watching it, stopped it, started watching it again. So it's tracking all the time they're spending. And then I can go and see that you know, some things are not that important. Like, for example, maybe this one is people get it, because that's why they are not maybe watching it again and again. Right? And then I can also do this. I can go and see uh, uh, you know, who is the most active person. So here's Jimmy has spent 403 hours this semester uh, watching uh, videos or doing something. And if I go down, I can see the numbers going down. So the percentage is by 100% means that they, that's the highest uh, total. And I can go and see you know, people like this not engage much. So I have the data to, uh, to, to show that. Right? Um, okay. Um, all right, and then um, let me um, let me hand this to uh, Marcus, so Marcus can say a few things about okay. his course, right? So that's my course, but then hopefully we'll have a discussion. Thanks. So, um, the, as, as Guna pointed out, this was developed by uh, an English professor and a computer scientist uh, in order to have better annotation tools for the humanities, right? So, uh, I'm a social science professor, and so I use it actually more in its original intended uh, uh, version. So, I teach a course uh, on social science methodology, it's a sophomore research seminar in which we students have to write their first research paper, and we're trying to teach them how to analyze the structure of an argument. So there's a lot of time spent. Uh, what are the elements of an argument, thesis, reasons, uh, objections, evidence? How do you assess the quality of these elements of an argument? And, um, and we use uh, short articles that they have to sort of pick apart and evaluate in terms of the quality of its uh, sort of structure. And then the hope is that they can use those insights in order to write more effective research paper on their own. Um, and so the, the way I use Salon is I also have short little videos. They watch the videos instead of multiple choice exams. I ask them to post one thing that they've learned and two things that they didn't understand. And then before class, I just go through those uh, uh, comments, uh, look at them, pick the most interesting ones, and start out the class by going over uh, things that weren't clear and, and, and discuss them and um, elaborate on it. Um, 
The other ways that I use uh, Salon was um, in two ways, is for sort of a um, crowdsourced midterm. So the midterm is here, they have to read an article, like here this is Amy Chua and Jeff Arthur, What Drives Success. Uh, it sort of was a, a book that was in the media, on the, the triple pack, uh, you know, sort of certain ethnic uh, groups have certain advantage in being more successful because in their culture there are certain values uh, embedded. So it was a fairly controversial uh, sort of reductionist cultural argument uh, that was provocative and had, had some, some sort of flaws. And as part of the midterm, they had to read it and write a short memo, five-page memo, evaluating it. But it's a fairly uh, difficult challenge because matching sort of the analytical categories that we use to the particularities of this argument for many of the students is, is a challenge. So what the midterm became was a two-step uh, uh, process. In, in the first step, um, they basically discussed collectively the strengths and weaknesses of the argument here on Classroom Salon. Uh, and the way it worked is there was a three-day window where they could not see any of the comments of their peers, but had to post individual questions. Uh, and I gave them certain prompts to remind them what we sort of learned, you know, talk, a, talk about a piece of evidence, look up a piece of evidence, you know, sort of do some fact checking, uh, point about uh, one reason that was strong, one reason, and evaluate the thesis. So out of those, they had to uh, post three. And then for five days, there's a group discussion, and then they were prompted to respond to any of those comments. And the idea was to get some sort of conversation going, right? So what you what you see here is I just highlighted some of the, the comments. Maybe I'll make this a little bit bigger here so you can actually read it. So you see most of the discussions were not particularly uh, deep. So here you have basically an exchange of, 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 this was by Michael, the original post. He said the next point I would like to make is that paper appears to contradict itself from the beginning to the end, because at the beginning, she sort of elaborates the thesis that certain ethnic groups have some of those attributes that make them successful. And the later part, uh, they sort of qualify the argument and said, well, it depends on, in, on individuals, right? So there's sort of a contradiction in the argument. On the one hand, it's a broad structural cultural argument, and that's sort of a qualification. That's what he points out. And then you have the students here sort of more or less agreeing with it. So this was a, a, an insightful comment, right? The responses more or less confirmed that this was insightful. Um, Can you click on that the analytics icon? Yeah, just a second. Let me oh, just. Uh, um, <laughs> I was so curious to see the structure there. Um, this year, this was a weaker student, and if you read through it, essentially what she does is she summarizes the argument, right? And then at the end, makes some minor point. Um, and so the students here responding to this, if I click on do the replies, um, you see, I don't quite agree here. So I don't know, this is the same person posting the same thing. I don't quite agree here. And so he sort of takes issue with her interpretation of the argument. So you see there's a little bit of learning going on, right? A good point uh, has positive responses. A weak point tends to generate uh, contradictions. And then there was a third point here. Um, uh, the article contradicts itself. Anyway, so this was another sort of strong point. So you can see um, this sort of took place over a five-day period, right? They were instructed. Um, so the incentive structure was the following. For the midterm, 50% of the, the midterm consisted in terms of how they contributed to the group discussion, and 50% was their actual memo. Uh, and in terms of the contribution was the consistency, how regularly. So if somebody posted uh, five posts on the last day of, of, of the midterm, right? He got a lower grade than the person that sort of checked in three or four times. Uh, they were evaluated in terms of how many responses you got. So this was meant to uh, give people an incentive to have some really interesting questions because it wasn't interesting questions. People were more likely uh, to uh, respond uh, to it. And then I also sort of eyeballed the comment and read through them. Uh, I did some quality check. And the other 50% were 
was the memo that they wrote. And in that memo, they could basically cherry pick and use any of the comments in here, and they didn't have to give credit for it, right? So the point then of the memo was for them to actually go through the comments, try to pick the best ones, try to crowdsource the insights, and then see whether they could integrate that into a coherent uh, answer. Uh, and lo and behold, you see that the better answers, right, all were more or less making the same points, and the weaker ones did not. So the stronger answer actually um, tried to learn from, from their sort of peers. So that, that sort of worked out. So let me just give you the behind the scenes, how this sort of looks like in terms of analytically. So you can see here, these were the days where they had to do the individual responses, right? So there were fewer responses because everybody only responded three times. Uh, and then they started to pick up, I guess, I don't know, did the basketball team come back yet? I forget, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and, um, and then really that's where, over those three days here, where most of the activity sort of took place. If you look at, go down, I mean, this is interesting, right? I mean, talk about good Catholic kids. You know, you tell them to, to post X number of things and every bubble is almost exactly the same size, right? <laughs> I mean, they, they learn to specification, and here you get the visual sort of uh, 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 proof uh, to it. And then in terms of the, the structures, so if the tree view here, you see uh, Duda's students, you know, there was only one response. Here, there's a little bit of a sort of deeper response. So Ryan started, as Jackie answered, Anthony responded, and then uh, Jackie responded as well to it, there was one incentive structure that you had to respond to one of your responses. So the reason why Jackie read Anthony is because he had responded to her and she met that checkbox in the grading categories, right? So, um, and, um, and Salon is set up in such a way that if, if somebody responds to you, you get an email notification uh, and sort of that's a way of sort of engaging them. So that's one way in which uh, I used so long. Another way was um, earlier on in the semester, so we taught them about the elements of an argument, and then I just used a very short article here. This is from James Servicki, who writes an economics columns for The New Yorker. These are usually very short, very well-written uh, arguments. And so what they had to do here is, as you can see, identify what is the thesis, what is the reason, what is an objection, what is evidence, and then tag them, right? Um, and so what you can do then is, so they did this, and then in class, we can uh, sort of see, did you tag the same things, right? So when, when they did this, they did not see what the other students tagged. So there was no uh, likelihood that they would just sort of copycat each other. And so one way in which you can then use this pedagogically in class is, is either you want to see in this particular section, so if you highlight this, it shows you all the, uh, all the highlights in that section. So notice this is the opening paragraph, thesis, 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 general thesis. So it seems like they, they were able to identify um, uh, the, the, the thesis. Um, if you then do the same thing for the next paragraph. Let me just okay. you'll, you'll notice there's, there's more variety here. Um, reasons, objections, reason. I mean, it might be because we're covering here three. three um, but if you go sentence by sentence, right, then you can sort of say, oh, look, on, on this there's agreement. Clear, we can move on. Or if there's some disagreement, you then ask, you can identify the, the person, Yannick. You, you thought this was an objection. Brian, you thought it was a reason. How come? And then you sort of discuss it. So these are some of the ways uh, in which I sort of use classroom uh, salon for analyzing arguments and, uh, and sort of pets. So what you see here is, is the current, the old version, what Bruno showed you 
is apparently the newer version uh, and, and improved version. And it works, uh, it works uh, really well. I mean, there are a few technical uh, problems. Uh, some of the things could be a little bit more elegant here and there, but he's working on this. Um, but uh, it, it really works, works well. And um, the students um, uh, like it and, and respond positively to it. OK? Thank you. <laughs> so I guess I think um, you know we don't want to make this. Let's make it a little bit more interactive, and because I I I, I want to uh, share a few more things about uh, my domain. Uh, I don't know how many of you teach physics, chemistry. How many of you teach science subjects? Physics, your physics, right? Biology. Biology, yeah. So, um, so in my domain, the uh, it's really important to uh, get the student engaged by. In fact, I did. Uh, if I can, let me just get, show you some of the uh, the surveys I did. So I wanted to find out the. Uh, okay, that's this not. Yeah, um, we go to uh, Salon, uh, Rima. So I will show you some of the uh, things that were important to my students. Uh, so I asked the, yeah, by the way, if you, uh, uh, let's see here, one second. Uh, let's see here, this one. Uh, so, um, Here's the my model of content engagement life cycle. So this is, uh, I think we have to think about the, uh, you know, how we get the students to work with the content. How do we get them engaged? So obviously I have first update, prepare the content, view or update them later. Um, in my case, I wanted to do engagement prompts. So that will assure that they have a guide. Because in my students all need a guide. They said, tell me what to, you know, they need to have something so that they can start. They don't make comments. Um, <clears throat> because when I ask them to say, you know, watch this video and ask some questions, nobody asks questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I, so I ask the questions. And so they have to respond. And then you can set the minimum requirements of engagement uh, by setting instructor prompts and then access the analytics, and then provide the feedback, and then refine your teaching. And that's my cycle of sort of thought process. Mm -hmm. So I go through this, update it, I go through this, obviously I can't do the same thing again and again, but this is really what I go through to get the students to engage. Um, <clears throat> and then I ask the students uh, also the, uh, okay, so preparing updated content, you can upload, uh, you can debate the engagement prompts, uh, and then I will tell them the sort of the minimum requirements. Uh, I would say that you must respond to all prompts, and they can choose. Because in my case, I may have like five videos, five short videos for each lecture, so they can choose to do like three or four prompts across all five videos, rather than all of them. Uh, ask questions anonymously, reply to question, discussion posed by another student, be consistent, these are all the things. And then uh, you have to tell them exactly how you're going to provide them with an engagement score. So what's an engagement score? Let me just show you what an engagement score is. Uh, um, so what the, what the students get in my class, this may not work for all the classes, but I'll show you like a maybe a fake student account. Uh, <coughs> this is what they see. So when they log in, there's, this is the, what the students see. Um, student has a notebook, so all the notes they make, they can make printouts of that. But if I wait just a little bit, I'm going to get an engagement score here. Um, so this shows how engaged they are. So when they ask me what do they need to do, in fact, I decided next semester I'm not going to put the number in here. 
I'm just going to put a color. So yellow means you're kind of okay, green means you're doing good, red means you're not doing good, right? So that's it. It's a very simple way of letting them know that they're not, see like for example, they're not, this person is not asking enough questions. That's why it's red. Uh, doing well with the comments, doing well with the consistency. And Excuse me, can the instructor set that the way you want? You just said you were going to do something different next time without a number. Is that yeah. something we get to set up? As That's right. As the instructor from the salon settings, you can say how you want this thing computed. Right? What does a green circle mean? What does a red circle mean? You know, what does that mean to you? Right? Maybe for some class it means asking a lot of questions. It's a green circle. So you could do that by setting from the uh, setting up these. These are the four things we track. Uh, you can do that, and then as a student, students can also see uh, if they go to their dashboard, they can see the how the class is doing versus how they're doing. So they can see how many times they have gone to a video or read a document, and. Um, uh, it's the case that you get like a happy face or a sad face <laughs> if you're less than the average. Uh, so they get to see some of these things. Uh, so again, and, and going back to my salon units. So I asked the students also what they thought of that. Uh, so I got some feedback from them. So I asked them, you know, what factors contribute you to get engaged with the course material and so on. And overwhelmingly, they were saying, I mean, I mean, I guess the local prompts was very, very important. And they also, in my field, I think they want to hear from the instructor a lot. Uh -huh. And uh, and the one thing about local prompts is that uh, you can reuse them if you build some prompts into the documents, you can take that document and use it next semester, removing all the uses and all the comments. It's a brand new thing, you don't have to do it again. No. So it, it saves a lot of time. Um, so prompts was very important in, in my domain. And then, uh, so engagement is something I think we should really think about. You know, what factors really contribute to you engaging in the course overall? Um, Obviously, this is what I got. Uh, the, uh, in fact, they didn't like the engagement score. <laughs> you can see that. So that's why I'm trying to remove the, the number. Because I think, because if it's staring at you all the time, you know, you log in, right? They get nervous. Uh, so I think it's a negative, it had a negative impact as opposed to a positive thing. I was thinking it's going to be encouraging them to do more. But it was not. Not if they don't know what it means. Yeah, exactly. Or how are you going to use it? it? Right, exactly. So, you know, they wanted me to, you know, because the problem was, you know, I use a formula that is based on the sort of the, it depends on how other people do too, right? So they said that when I was going to bed, it was green, but when I came back, it was red. Yeah. <laughs> so that means, the, well, the person was sleepy, other people were active. And they got ahead. Right? <laughs> so I was trying to create a competition, to, but it, it backfires sometimes. Right? Okay. Um, so the <laughs> it's really interesting stuff. Uh, anyway, so I think I'd like to have a maybe a Q and A, uh, and have maybe a discussion here a little bit. So yeah. What's the relationship between, as you can see so far, the engagement score and how much students are learning? Oh, yeah. Both grades and other kinds of students? <coughs> There's high correlation. The, the correlation fact is about 0.4, maybe, the relation between engagement score and the, uh, actually the course outcome. We have looked at, uh, in fact, one of the interesting things we are doing it, uh, is that we take all the data, like if you take your grade book, you have variety of measures, right? You have number of assignments, things like that. In my case, I actually ran it through a machine learning algorithm to understand mm -hmm. what factors actually contribute to the final outcome based on historical data. 
So based on that, you can you can say certain things, certain assignments, certain lectures contribute more to the final score, the final grade, than other things. This is based on historical things. But you can easily do your research because Salam, you can ex export all the data. Uh, everything, every uh, comment they make come out with the, as a CSV file. So you can take that and you can write a Python script or whatever if you like to play with the data, you can do a lot of stuff. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's the most important thing to me. At least in my domain, we got uh, the, you know, Google gave us a grant. This is how Salam is running. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a grant we got last year from Google uh, for $700,000, they, uh, it was, we have a problem. We have a growing demand for the field for whatever the reasons, right? And then our numbers are going up and our faculty is not going up, right? So now we cannot give the attention that we are supposed to give the students. So we gotta find a way to get the technology to help. So we have a lot of automation that is helping, so we are using Classroom Salon as a way to do this. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so I, I, I think I'll stop here. A question about um, all those all those metrics. You've got 230 students in your classroom. Um, what do you do for a student for one out of, uh, for the 20 out of 230 that have a 5% participation score? Are you sending them emails? Or yeah, <clears throat> the message board, so there's a, uh, the, you can send a group email to you know, the, those who are doing, not doing the work. Because the only way you can get them to engage is by reminding them you're supposed to be engaged. Right? And uh, the nice thing is, like you said, you know, I can go to the list and go to the bottom of the list and say, Let, let's pick those people and send them a reminder. It's still up to them to do the things. But, mm -hmm. So, so, but how would, how do you think the engagement differs in using Salon versus when you would be doing this face to face? I mean, like, are oh, the oh. percentage of students who are engaged greater than they would be? I mean, the... I think that some students um, prefer to be engaged online as opposed to in class. So, this is a forum, right? It's any online forum would be. You want what I found, I, I used it for a face-to-face -face class, a senior seminar, for seniors and junior, mostly seniors who were reading original documents, of journal articles, kind of, kind of high-level reading for them. And um, what I found was that they were required to comment, and, and it showed me that they'd read it beforehand, but the comments opened up the discussion face-to-face -face much more. So it kind of released this inhibition, and it, relieved, and, and it gave me a way of talking to them to say, hey, you said this on... So I had it up on screen while we were in class. They were doing it yeah. alone before they came before to class, came. but it was used both ways. I used it both in and out. But in this model, right, you're you're using this in place of of class time, right? Yes, um, I, I so think. That, yeah, my model here, the it's yeah, it, yeah, to reduce because what I'm trying to do is to figure out how to scale my class, right? Mm -hmm. So if I can teach. 25 students, you know, face to face, can I teach 50, to 50 students with this technology? I, that's the that's well, a problem well, I have to solve. What I'm wondering is, is, is how, how different are the results here than if you had a lecture hall course oh, with yeah, I, I think student sitting in it or something like exactly. that? Exactly. I mean, do you know how to measure that? I don't. Exactly. So that's yeah. the problem, right? Yeah. And we don't know how to measure exactly. what students do in class. Right? Totally in my experience is on the salon, uh, female students tend to perform much better than they do in the in-class. So uh, that, that was an interesting uh, observation. Yeah, have you done any more demographic analysis of students who prefer the online, the students who engage their degree? Well, I, I don't, my, my course is just classroom salon, so I don't have a control uh, at class. Mm -hmm. But you know they participate in, in for some readings in class and for others online, and that's where that gender difference sort of shows up. Actually, at first so we did other underrepresented groups. Or, or. So, yeah, we did a control study at Princeton, and with the 
blended model, which is one day a week meeting, but mostly engagement online, versus the traditional live lectures. And you know, the, consistently for three semesters, they were like B to B plus range. You know, the the guys who were engaged in online were B plus, and the other ones were B on the on average. So they were consistently performing slightly better than the others. Uh, <clears throat> But I think this is a question, you know, in fact, you know, Princeton, uh, you know, they like this stuff, at the same time they don't like it, right? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Was there self-select there, or did, were they randomly assigned? Uh, they did uh, self-select, but their demographics were not much different. We looked at their yep. backgrounds. Mm -hmm. They were not the strongest people or the weakest people. They were just a random sample. They were self-selecting because of whatever the reason. Right, because they didn't want to come to class one day. Maybe that's the reason they did. <clears throat> um, what are the other thoughts? Because I like to hear kind of from you, like, you know, what engagement means to you. Any thoughts? Yeah. The, the, getting them to actually speak in class. So the irony for me is using this distant method, online method, to get them to feel more comfortable talking in class. Right, that's why that's what got me to it. It wasn't it wasn't necessarily the, the depth and sophistication of what happened online. It was the ability to get them to open their mouths in class yeah. and and be participatory that way. So that was my initial right. initial urge for using this. But also, I mean, I think it depends for me. It depends on which level of student I'm trying to get to. And so what I would really like to be able to do is try this on with first year students um, to get them early on. I'm. Getting seniors to talk is painful in a senior seminar. I mean, they've checked out in some ways, but it's still painful. If you can get them to start talking earlier um, and, and get them accustomed to this kind of dialogue, both yeah. online and in person, they would carry it through to their senior year and be, be more engaged. Yeah, I think the only way to measure engagement is to have the tools to, yeah. Yeah. to know that they're engaged. Yeah. Otherwise, we don't. We don't. We're, not, we're never going to know whether they're engaged. It's just a good feeling. Of, of how yeah. much more they're willing to talk when they've had Salon helping them during the week. Yeah. How permeable is this platform? Is it, is it an on off, closed or open, or closed salons and open salons, or can elements of it be, can you create a link so that you can publicly share some elements? I'm just saying something. Yeah. Every document has its own link that oh. can be sent with an email or something. You click on it, it opens just that. Like, even if you don't have an account. Oh, you need to have an account, yeah, so too. That's my question. If somebody wants to build something in here and then share it on Facebook, right. share it through other social media, or if my students prefer to create their own content on their own mm -hmm. server space and platform and then link comments in, right? Because one yeah. of the things we want our students to do is have more control over, over their own you know, creation and content and data. Is that possible? It's, it's possible, possible as long as it's public link, right? So, you know, salons can be public or private. Right. So if you have a public salon, any document link can be opened by anyone else from another place. But there aren't granular privacy permissions within a course. Uh, you can do that. I mean, we have a whole number of sort of access things, like you can block certain users from a certain document, and it gets, gets complicated. You know, it's very difficult to manage, but they are there if you want to do it. Um, yeah, so, uh, but I think, well, you had a question, right? You had a question in the back here. The, there's a nice feature that I noticed in terms of working with learning management systems. So I could take a, make a link mm -hmm. in my Moodle site yeah. that would take them directly to the reading in yeah. the salon and the commentary. Because what I was trying to avoid was having them have to go outside of Moodle to yes. get to salon. So that was a, a really helpful. I think Marcus has a lot of experience with that. Yeah, it's the same thing. Actually, I mean, that home page, that landing page that he showed, most of the students never see that because they go back and forth between Blackboard and the individual document. But separate volume. No. They have to be enrolled in your salon class, and they have to be enrolled in the Moodle class. Right, but if you're but in Moodle your, and you click Moodle, the you link. Click on that link, if you have the professor set it up that way, then they will take, it'll take you right Right into. Yeah, it should open it up. But, 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 but it, they passes, are separate. it passes all of the your credentials so the student doesn't uh, have to log in a second time. No. 
No, it does not right now. So it doesn't have a federated log. It's called okay. federated login. That's that's something we should be doing. You know more. That uh, I think with Princeton course we'll be doing that next semester. That they just click on a link, it'll grab all the authentication information from the Princeton service, and then automatically create <coughs> the account and keep track of everything. So they don't have to worry. Yeah, so once we do that, then it's easier. I mean, when Marcus has every the whole course, when you take the, you have a Blackboard course, right? Mm -hmm. So he takes the Blackboard course from one semester to the other, he can remove all the comments of users from the salon, and you're ready to go again. You have all your comments and other things saved, right? Okay, I guess, you know, that's all I had to, because it's getting late, right? So, can you tell us about, yeah. um, Changes in the PDF, how, how PDFs will work. Oh yeah, PDFs. I, yeah, I think that was the uh, the weakest uh, weakest part of our uh, platform, um, and so we integrated the much better PDF reader. So now you can scroll down, and when you want to highlight a PDF, let's see, here. Microsoft PDFs are here, so. So when you want to uh, annotate, you just annotate, and you can make a comment, and uh, you can add tags. Uh, so let's add a bunch of tags here, and uh, you can post as anonymous. You can make it a question if you're the instructor, and save it, and it's it's there. And uh, if you click on the tag, it filters by the tag. And if you go back to the old comments, so here's a much better way to, you know, this is one of the weakest points of the salon until now. Now that we have integrated the <clears throat> much better reader into this, if I, you can even do like a page by page navigation, you can jump into specific pages. So it's like just like a regular PDF embedded into it, but they will keep track of everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this way, you put it, all your PDFs into uh, into the platform. So if you if you wanted to find out what people don't understand, you could sort of buy your pre-made tag of I don't understand this. Exactly. Yeah, you click on it, and it will show you all the comments. And then if you click on the comment, you can see which part of the document they didn't understand. And that's your plan, right? So I mean, before I go to my class, I go through those and make a little plan and say, you know, the things I'm going to do. I guess my other question was an old issue that you and I have talked about before is about um, using materials for publishers because what I really wanted was to have my uh, the ability to put my textbook yeah. up on Salon and of course that wasn't going to happen. We come out, you know, the publishers weren't giving me any files yeah. or, or you know. Right. Do with that. So the good news is that the publishers have realized that they are losing the share. There's a lot of open educational resources out there. Uh, and so they have been open to lots of different models. So they use, they are, they are giving their content to any distribution platform like Salon. Really? Yeah, so they are much more open to doing that now really? than they used to be. Because they thought everyone will come to their site and get the book. The big publishers are still a little, but they are beginning to realize that. We have a number of uh, Princeton professors who have written books and we can, they choose to disseminate their information through multiple platforms. Okay, so probably not the textbook publishers though. Oh, they, this is a textbook published by Addison Wesley. So in addition to Addison Wesley, they are also disseminating this through other platforms that can be better. You know, they all have different boards, right? So you can have an ebook platform here, salon platform here. So hopefully, well, I think we'll have a way to uh, link up with the. The, the best chance for this is one of the projects we're going to do is we're going to link up with a lot of open educational resources. So you will find, uh, hopefully by, by fall, when you go to the Salam page and if you search for, uh, you know, if you search for any kind of a public Salam um, and uh, you will probably find books. Salons that already has textbooks loaded into it. They're done by, they are, we will pick the best open educational resources. They're free. And so what you can do is you can adapt one of those salons for your class. You can say, let me make a copy of that. 
So you will get a, your own copy of all that content, and then you can add yours, you can put your annotations, and you'll be at that goal. So one way to do this is to really show the publishers that you know, they can't dominate this, you know, the content to, to show that there's a lot of good open content out there, and we should pick the best and make it available for free to the, to the classes. And uh, once we do that, then you know, publishers will have to respond more and more to these kind of things. Uh, yeah, and the PDFs can support live uh, links in there. Oh yeah, yeah. So when you yeah when you put a link, you can put like a, a URL or something. Right. You can so that way you can gain access to lots of other formats other than those three that you can if you choose. To. Yes, right, right. So you can. In fact, I can click on you know I link to Google Doc and I can link my Dropbox file. You know, I can link a lot of things somewhere else. There's yeah, it's somewhere else. Simulation that you yeah. want them to see. Exactly. They don't have to live in sites while uh, you can link anything. So it's good. Uh, okay, so I guess the uh, thank you for coming and hopefully we'll keep, you know, if you please, please. Do the that survey so I know who was here, right? So I think I've seen some of your What's that? I can, I can yeah, maybe maybe when you go out of there, because there may be a firewall or something okay. that's blocking you from getting into that AD eighty two. I'm sure you can get into classroom salon, right? I do, and yeah. I'm looking for your uh, salon, but I can't find it. Yeah, so but if, if as soon as you go out of this, you know, because some places they, they will block that. Right. Subdomain because it's like colon yeah. yeah. but it but yeah. you will be fine when you go back. Yeah. But but in the fall it'll convert to classroomsland.com. That will be our platform, yeah. not the eighty-two. That won't be eighty-two. Yeah.